Hi guys! Today we are going to be describing Tulip Mania and clearing up some misconceptions about what it actually is, and we're going to be comparing it to what I coined in the last video, Monstera Mania. So this is part two of a two-part series of sorts. The first part is describing why Monster Mania could be considered an economic bubble. In case you forgot, we'll do a little recap on what an economic bubble is. It's when the price of something rapidly increases and it deviates from what it's actually worth. I also describe what these plants are actually worth and my rationale for that in part one of the video. Historically, they sold Philodendron Pink Princess for $6.50 for a plant in a 4-inch pot. It now sells for $250, but again, you don't need to watch part 1 in order to understand this video, so watch it if you want to, don't watch it if you don't want to, whatever. Let's get into Tulip Mania and go into the version that is popularly told and the version that you may know versus the version that's more realistic. The narrative mentioned by most people comes from a single source, which already is not a good idea because if you write an essay, your professor or teacher usually won't <laughs> let you hand it in or they'll give you a really bad grade because it could be incorrect information or heavily biased. This book was called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and Madness of Crowds, published by Scottish journalist Charles McKay in 1841. I'd like to highlight the fact that this was written in 1841, which is about 200 years after this actually happened meaning Charles McKay did not live through the event to write about it. The depiction was actually from three anti-speculative pamphlets from 1637, which is when tulip mania was actually going on. Anti-speculative simply means that these people did not want the tulip market to succeed. They wanted the prices to crash and it to fail miserably. These pamphlets were also anonymous, so who wrote them? Someone's cat? Like, I don't know. These aren't exactly unbiased or credible sources, per se. Charles McKay book also included a plethora of other topics, such as witch hunts, haunted houses, and alchemy. Alchemy is the attempt to turn less valuable metals like copper or nickel into gold, if you were wondering. Newsflash, this never worked, so don't try it. You're wasting your time. McKay read the book from a storyteller perspective, and overall it was pretty dramatized and sensationalistic. On to McKay's description of tulip mania, or tulip mania as we know it. It is the 1600s Netherlands, and they are in a very prosperous period of their history. Everyone has a decent amount of disposable income, and they are very interested in tulips. When we think about tulip mania, we mainly think about the Semper Augustus tulip, which is called a broken tulip. Broken tulips, like the Semper Augustus, were much harder to come by because the color breaking was caused by a virus. This means you kind of just find these tulips by surprise. You can't really hybridize two different color tulips in order to get a broken tulip. Overall, according to McKay, all tulips were valuable, broken or not, common or rare, all very valuable. McKay further went into the prices paid for some of the more coveted broken tulip varieties. In the book, McKay describes the lot of goods traded for one bulb of the Viceroy tulip, two lasts of wheat, four lasts of rye, four fat oxen, eight fat swine, twelve fat sheep, two hogsheads of wine, four tons of beer, two tons of butter, one thousand pounds of cheese, a complete bed, a suit of clothes, and a silver drinking cup. Just FYI, if you've been living under a rock for the past four centuries, a last is 4,000 pounds, and a ton is equivalent to 250 gallons. I can't believe they called the sheep fat. Does anyone want to give me a fat sheep for this? A bulb of the most sought after tulip, the Semper Augustus, was sold for 12 acres of land. Apparently. Uh, the Semper Augustus, in all its sophisticated elegance, redolent of simpler times when people violently ill with the plague bitted on equally diseased tulips that hadn't even broken through the earth yet. How romantic. I will now read you an excerpt from McKay's book just to show you what level this mania had reached, apparently. You roll in your eyes and you act like this because you've heard it all before. Many individuals suddenly became rich. A golden bait hung temptingly out before the people, and one after the other 
they rushed to the tulip marts like flies around a honey pot. Everyone imagined the passion for philodendron tulips would last forever, and that the wealthy from every part of the world would send to Holland and pay whatever prices were asked for them. The riches of Europe would be concentrated on the shores of the Zunder Zee, and poverty banished from the favored clime of Holland. Nobles, citizen, farmers, mechanics, seamen, footmen, maidservants, even chimney sweeps and old clothes women dabbled in tulips. According to McKay's description, these tulips made Holland very wealthy. At some point during the mania, there were a few bulbs that were put up before auction. They did not sell. Subsequently, the prices fell because everyone was spooked, and a lot of people were left in financial ruin. McKay described that the entire Dutch economy was affected. So let's go on to the reality of the situation. Like I said before, the Dutch were going through a golden age of sorts. The economy was very prosperous from trading overseas. This made the Dutch comparatively more wealthy than the rest of their European counterparts. I got rid of the green screen. I don't think my iPhone camera works really well with it. On with the rest of the video. It was the virgining period of modern finance in the Netherlands. People were eager to sign contracts for money in exchange for a good or product in the future as opposed to doing it immediately. Basically, people would sign contracts to buy tulips for a specified price from the growers at a later date. This is called a futures contract, and this is how most of the tulips were purchased and sold in this time period. You know, it's not like going to a farmer's market, you give your money to that white man in dreadlocks, you know, with a nose ring that smells like frankincense and myrrh. You get your heirloom, non-GMO, free range, whatever, rainbow carrots and leaves. Transaction closed. He can go buy some CBD oil for his diffuser and you can go eat your overpriced rainbow carrots. Part of the reason this was done is because bulbs could only be lifted from June to September. This means the rest of the year they have to stay in the ground in order to grow. Mind you, the massive increase in price lasted from November 1636 to February 1637, which fell from there. This means that no tulip bulbs were ever exchanged and it was just contracts set up for a later date of purchase. These contracts were not officially recognized by the Dutch government and they were seen as gambling. This means from a legal perspective, neither party was obligated to fulfill their end of the contract. However, early in 1637, which is while well, tulip mania was still going on, Dutch florists, which were the people that were selling these bulbs, pushed to ratify legislation to make all contracts signed after November 30th, 1636, enforceable by law. Now, this was not the full price agreed upon the tulips in the contract. This was only 3.5% of that price. Now, 3.5% was still something because the prices were inflated so drastically, but it was definitely not what the prices were made out to be. This was done to protect the florists in case the prices fell and the people that signed the contracts did not follow through with paying them. The people that signed these contracts to pay for the tulips were now held accountable by law to pay for some portion of the tulips, whereas before they could just sign the contract and if it was favorable for them to pay it, they would pay it, and if not, they wouldn't. All of a sudden, the deal for these buyers got a lot less sweet because it turned from a win-nothing situation to a win-lose situation, meaning people now had the potential to lose money when signing these contracts. Going back to the legislation pushed by the Dutch florists, this was signed February 24th, 1637. And of course, with anything, it takes time for legislation to pass. So people kind of figured out this was going on before the prices started to fall. That led to the collapse in prices on February 3rd. I'm now going to tell you what happened on February 3rd, 1637 to kind of cause this. None of the buyers in the city of Harlem, not Harlem, New York, this is the Netherlands, showed up to a routine bulb auction. Of course, there were already whispers of this legislation passing, holding people accountable for the bulb sales. So people saw this and saw that these bulbs were no longer desirable or in demand. They kind of got spooked and the prices fell. Funny enough, it's speculated that the rise and fall in tulip mania was due to an epidemic of the bubonic plague in the Netherlands at the time. This lasted from 1635 to 1636, and according to the article I read, the plague is like a summer disease. We're cool for the summer. So it usually kind of increases during the summer and decreases during the fall. So it kind of ended as tulip mania started. 
Mind you, this was before the development and deployment of antibiotics in the 1950s, so if you got the bubonic plague before then, you had a 30 to 60% chance of dying. So apparently, a fatalistic culture of risk-taking spurred on this phenomenon. Buying tulips is probably not the first thing I'd think of doing if I was gonna die shortly, but uh, you know, it's each their own. Dutch people do what they do. Also, uh, when people die, you inherit you know, their money and stuff. So people had some, you know, extra disposable income to put into tulip bulbs, I guess. Like the people that are like, just got my stimulus check, I'm gonna buy a philodendron. Ah, uh, incurable diseases and unexpected sources of income. So as people went into 1637, people realized they probably weren't going to die of the plague because the epidemic was over and they kind of screwed their heads on right. In the end, all the contracts for tulips signed previous to November 30th, 1636 fell through. The rest of them were paid at a marginal rate, if that, and uh, it didn't really affect much. Also, as opposed to literally everyone participating in tulip mania, you know, from nobles to chimney sweepers, it was only merchants and skilled craftsmen that actually participated in this. And of those people, it was only those in urban areas that had places to auction the bulbs that could participate. Compared to what McKay described in his book, only a very small fraction of people participated in this tulip trading comparatively. There is no historical evidence of it impacting the economy of the Netherlands, and there isn't really any verifiable sources that anyone was actually financially ruined from this. It's more something that McKay just exaggerated to fit within the narrative of the book and something that people ran with because it sounded so absurd. So, was tulip mania an economic bubble as it's made out to be? In my last video, part one, which is my very last video, we kind of went over why I think monsteromania, I called it monsteromania, is an economic bubble. It's basically when the price of something deviates from its kind of regular price or its value. Let's say for the past 20 years you could go to the store and you could find a golden pothos basket for $15 and then all of a sudden one day it's $300 because everyone's after it. That's kind of a bubble. This is not happening to golden pothos but this is happening to other aeroids and unlike tulip mania we're not drawing up contracts to pay 3.5 percent of the price for these aeroids and exchange the money for the plants in the future. We're doing it right now. Money is ending up in someone's hands and plants are ending up in someone else's hands. For anything to constitute as an economic bubble, there has to be an exchange of money and goods. Because this didn't happen in tulip mania, all the bulbs stayed in the ground and all of the money stayed in the people's hands for the most part of the people that signed the contracts. We can't really call it an economic bubble. If you are an American, an actual economic bubble with very real consequences you may be familiar with is the 2007-2008 housing market crash. In the early 2000s, financial institutions began lending money to home buyers that were unlikely to be able to pay their mortgages. This was because people were investing in the mortgage finance sector and there was an influx of money to lend. This caused people to buy a bunch of houses and because of that, the prices of houses increased and it attracted more people to buy more houses because they thought the price was going to continue to increase in the future, so it's a good investment. As prices increased, it deviated strongly from the cost to build those houses. At some point, people realized what was going on, the prices collapsed, and so did our economy. In conclusion, I would say what's going on in the aeroid market right now is more analogous to the early 2000s housing market compared to tulip mania. The cost of propagation and house construction has remained relatively stable over time, but the price of those two have deviated from the cost drastically. In the early 2000s housing market bubble, people that already have houses are going out and buying more houses, thinking they're going to go up in price and they'll be able to sell them for a profit. People in the aeroid market might buy a plant even if they don't like it, or they'll buy multiples thinking that they're going to be able to propagate it and sell it for a higher price in the future because prices are ever increasing. I got a comment in my last video. There's a person, they overheard people, I think in a Facebook group that said they wanted to quit their job and they wanted to flip plants. What's similar in both cases is this artificial demand. People buying things that they don't want or need 
in order to make money off of it. Nurseries have imposed limits on these plants to avoid that. Before all of this, you bought a plant because you wanted a plant, not because you wanted to buy it and flip it right then or buy it and propagate it to sell it in the future. And of course, this sparks other people's interests and they're like, why is this plant so special? I need to have this plant. And others desire them for how expensive and unavailable they are because it creates exclusivity. And you just get this snowball effect of ever inflating prices. Prices go up until some point, you know, people aren't willing to pay those prices. And of course, this doesn't happen all at once. People don't just like, change their minds in unison. All it takes is a bit of doubt and your philodendron, your mom's a hoeanum, doesn't sell at auction because it didn't meet its reserve price. And it happens a few more times and people are shocked. They're like, normally philodendron, your mom's a hoeanum at that size go for at least $30,000. All of a sudden, all the sellers and resellers that have been buying everything flood the market with their stuff because they don't want it anymore because it's going to go down in price and they want to get rid of it, you know, while the prices are still relatively high. This just releases all of the supply that was just bought up by those people in order to make money. Of course, the prices drop and the people that, you know, purchase the plants to maintain some semblance of exclusivity are now disinterested because it's not exclusive. You're no longer cool because people don't envy your philodendron, your mom's a hoeanum. And people will kind of like scurry to whatever else they can cling on to. It's an Instagram thing. You go on Instagram to flex expensive things for the most part. There are 60,000 tags for philodendron pink princess. If you get a rare aeroid, you post it on Instagram. That's like, that's what everyone does. And that's the economic bubble because it's all in here and it's not, you're stepping away from economics and you're making it more about the human psyche. And people's minds can shift very quickly. So that's about it. I would recommend that you go out and buy as many Monstera Obliquas as you can afford. But don't leave quite yet because that ridiculous depiction of tulip mania spurred even more ridiculous depictions of tulip mania in artwork. And I think it would be a crime against humanity not to show you because this is literally the best artwork I've ever seen. So our first one is called The Tulip Folly. This is by Jean-Léon Jean. I don't know how to, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. It's French, I think. Louis oui, oui, Baguette? Um, Louis oui, oui, Vuitton. Anyways, 1882, a nobleman guards an exceptional bloom as soldiers trample flower beds in a vain attempt to stabilize the tulip market by limiting the supply. You think someone will like hack into eBay? <laughs> like take down listings? I just love this. I mean, this man is, he's just very quaint. He's just standing there, he has a sword. He's protecting his tulip um, <laughs> while everyone's just like just running. I, you know, this is, I don't know what to make of this, but I love it. That's hot. What if that's what you were ordered to do? Like your job was to go like trample tulips? That's hot. <laughs> like we have a special mission for you today. Love the photo, but don't you think it would be more efficient to like use some type of tool? like a rake or you know and, and you know like a scythe or something well i'm gonna have to get a print of that but we will go on to our next one which i like even more this one is called the wagon of fools by hendrik gritz pot painted in 1637 which was the year that the tulip market crashed the description says followed by harlem weavers who have abandoned their looms blown by the wind and flying a flag emblazoned with tulips flora goddess of flowers her arms laden with tulips rides to their destruction in the sea along with tipplers money changers and the two-faced goddess fortuna can we just appreciate these like three men that have tulips just like sticking out of their heads i don't know i love this I, <laughs> I love how it says rides to their destruction in the sea and there's a tulip flag i need to get a tulip flag like i didn't know that these things existed these like wind powered carts i'm sure it's like windy there or something so it works i also love how there's a two-faced goddess called fortuna like Iconic. That is the ugliest effing skirt I've ever seen. Our next painting is called The Satire of Tulip Mania by John Bleuche the Younger, circa 1640. Bleuche. How do you pronounce that? 
B -b 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 what? I don't know. I think it's Dutch. Okay, so depicts speculators as brainless monkeys in contemporary upper class dress. In a commentary on the economic folly, one monkey urinates on the previously valuable plants. Others appear in Deptor's court, and one is carried to the grave. You know what? I like it. Not as much as the last one, because I love a two-faced goddess. Oh my god, I love your bracelet. Where did you get it? But... <laughs> The urinating monkey really is a nice touch. Really sets this one apart. I also love how there's just like a court outside. And uh, yeah, there's a lot going on here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, I like it. And here's another one of the same artist, another monkey peeing on the tulips, coincidentally in the same place. Uh, you know what, uh, you know, maybe it was his thing. I'm not gonna tell people what to do with their time. Here's another one. I couldn't find the origin, but they dress this woman in a jester outfit, which is like entertainment for usually like royalty. A funny idea, a jester. I guess it looks like they're trying to balance the gold for the tulip bulb. Could I do that? Just like get a markdown bag of tulip bulbs from Walmart in December and just trade it for its weight in gold. I really like how there's a single tulip in an urn without leaves. And then this jester looking lady is also holding a tulip, but there are also tulip bulbs on the table. So like, how is it simultaneously the time of year where tulips are flowering and you can have tulip bulbs on the table? And it's art, whatever. So that's it. I hope you liked the video. I have some links and references down below that I used to make this video, so feel free to check them out. I did put a lot of effort into the video and I will do so moving forward, definitely subscribe if you like the video. I won't spam you guys with like stupid, you know, nonsense videos. Um, it'll probably be like once a week. It's not going to be caressing my philodendron at the stroke of midnight or whatever people do on YouTube. Are they just like, yeah. Also, I super welcome comments on this video and definitely last video if you haven't seen it because I think this is, you know, these are great videos to have discussion on. Whether you think I'm right or wrong or you can add some perspective, I think that's amazing. Like the video if you liked it and dislike the video if you didn't like it. All forms of criticism are welcome. My Instagram is phytosexual. You can ask me any quick questions. If you want to say hi or like send me a picture or whatever, I'd welcome you to do that as well. Thank you guys and I will see you soon.